everyone. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we know your time is precious, and we are five minutes behind the start. Still waiting for our panelists to join us. Steve is running into some technical issues with the software, uh, and he's, uh, he's coming on in a minute. <clears throat> so the sound should be much better. Let's start with our risk disclosure. Risk says trading futures, options on futures and foreign currency involves substantial risk of loss. It is not suitable for all investors. My personal opinions, market data, and recommendations subject to change without notice. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Our panelist is Steve Ribble, which shrink my taxes. It is a tax consulting firm. Steve's opinions and advice, it reflects uh, shrink my taxes. Opinion and advice is not a reflection of futurestrader71.com or our sponsor, Stage 5 Trading Corp. Um, we're, I'm still waiting for Steve, so I'm going to put my mic on uh, mute for a minute and see if I can help him uh, and then get back to you. Again, we're waiting for Steve Ribble, the panelist and the expert, to join us here. Uh, sincerely apologize for the delay. This is not normal uh, for when we're hosting a video. Looks like Steve is with us. Steve, hey. uh, your mic should be on. Can you uh, can you do a mic test, please? Hey, can you hear me okay? Steve, uh, there's hang on. There's two of you. So let me get rid of one of you. And then your voice is very faint. Can you test again, please? You hear me okay? Uh, can you all hear Steve fine? You just type FD, yes. FD, can you hear me? Okay. FD? All right, for Hello? some reason I'm not hearing you well, but I think that's on my end. Let me fix that. Hello? Steve, I can hear you now. That was on my okay, end. Okay, thank you. So, Steve, you should be seeing the screen. Um, so, the discussion today is uh, open to everyone. This is not just for Stage 5 traders. Uh, at Stage 5, uh, we generally, um, I, I am a principal at Stage 5, uh, and I'm Future Trader 71. Uh, at Stage 5, we do, an, a, we do a webinar every Tuesday called Convergence Tuesday, where we focus on a particular topic. So, this is open to Stage 5 traders, stage five clients, uh, anyone interested in stage five, uh, go to stage, the number five trading.com or stage five, the letters, F-I-V-E trading.com uh, to get information. It's a, it's a um, more of a high-end brokerage that myself and my partner, Anthony, have started. Uh, and this is where I am right now. This is where I work in addition to trading and, of course, helping others uh, trade. Um, the convergence event this Tuesday uh, is about taxes, given that uh, the year is coming to an end. We have about maybe uh, less than two weeks uh, to make final adjustments for our tax season. Uh, Steve Ribble. So let me just move on to the next slide here. So the topic at hand is smart account management discussion with shrinkmytaxes.com. The panelist is Steve Ribble. He's the president of Shrink My Taxes. There's also another firm that you're uh, president of, right? What is that called? Uh, Trader Tax Coach. Trader Tax Coach. And that's a .NET, right? That's .NET, yeah. That's, uh, that, that's my site that I've dedicated just towards uh, traders and, and you know, tax issues for traders. So okay. it's a, more of a specialist site. Very cool. So uh, Steve is taking the time out of his day today. We're going to be talking for uh, about an hour, and we're just going to discuss tax issues. This mainly affects U.S. Um, residents, but you might get some ideas if you are in the uh, Eurozone, U.K., and other places. And uh, as, as, as always, it's very, very important that you consider your own financial um, financial situation and consult with uh, either Steve if you're in the U.S. Uh, or your uh, own tax accountant if you're uh, outside the U.S. Steve is probably, I don't know how comfortable you are to talk about other tax jurisdictions. So, 
Uh, yeah, it's uh, that's a, a tricky area. Some uh, some countries have trees, but but generally, uh, I, I stick to guys here in the U.S. Okay. So who is Steve? Why should we listen to him, right? Who Who is this guy? Steve is um, the founder and CEO of Shrink My Taxes. It's a tax accounting, uh, tax and accounting firm catering to the trading community. He's a specialist in trader taxation and trading entities. Steve is a highly sought-after public speaker and works with traders from all over the United States, uh, putting in place proactive strategies to minimize their taxes. Steve's role is very, very important. I've had a tax uh, accountant. Uh, and tax um, attorney since I started trading and it it becomes much more important as the numbers get bigger as you push you know 100 uh, 150,000 something like that but it's also it's even more significant when you're not pushing those higher numbers as as profits from um, from trading because uh, the government can take a big bite out of whatever it is that you're doing and we want to minimize that um, portion that goes to the government uh, as much as possible while still uh, fulfilling our duty as a citizen to pay taxes for the services that we receive. Uh, the, goal is, the goal here is to pay but not to have to pay more than uh, what's required and that's basically what Steve does. Uh, the idea is to create uh, structures or to place, uh, to situate your, your accounting and finances in such a way that there is a minimal impact. One of the things we'll talk about, I'll show you a slide of the questions that Steve is going to cover and of course we're going to open it up for questions to anyone who's uh, willing to ask in the GoToWebinar panel. Um, one of the questions is should I be trading as an individual or as an entity and there are many, many, many uh, pieces to this puzzle that uh, Steve will talk about. So the questions we're going to go into are these. And Steve is basically going to take over from here. This is going to be in the format of a question and answer panel. First question for you, Steve. How are futures contracts taxed? Thanks, FT. Um, futures contracts, uh, you know, as, as probably most of you guys are aware, uh, you have a preferential tax treatment. Um, you've got a 60-40 uh, tax split on futures regardless of holding period. I think that's one of the, the primary advantages or one of the big advantages of, of trading futures. 60% um, of your your gain is going to be taxed as uh, at long-term rates and 40% would be taxed at short-term rates. Can you remind um, us what those rates are? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you. I've actually, uh, I actually have it. Uh, I took some notes earlier because I knew we'd be discussing this, but um, it, it's going to depend upon your tax bracket. So it, the long-term rates are either 0% if you're at the 15% uh, or lower tax bracket for, for long-term cap gains. You're at 15% if you're uh, anywhere from uh, just above 15% all the way up to the 35% uh, bracket. And if you're in the highest bracket uh, at 39.6%, then, then you're talking about a 20% tax rate on long-term cap gains. So if, if you blend all that together, um, I mean, you're looking at the highest bracket at 39.6. Um, you're talking about an effective tax rate of about 27.8%. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's, that's almost a 12% a you know, tax savings uh, you know, by trading futures. That's just um, simply clicking and trading on futures as opposed to trading equities or, or other products. You got it, yeah, as opposed to trading stocks or, or options or, or things like that. So. Um, I mean, you're, you're talking about some pretty significant, you know, savings from that standpoint. So, you know, I wrote down like an example of a, somebody in the 28% tax bracket. Um, you know, if you made $100,000 trading and you traded stocks, you've got, you know, a $28,000 tax due uh, on, on those dollars. But if it was a futures gain, um, you're talking about owing 20000 in taxes. So you're, you know, you're at $8,000 tax savings, you know, just, just through trading futures. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and it also extends out to other Section 1256, um, you know, category uh, vehicles, if you will, and that would be foreign currency future contracts. So maybe you don't trade ES or NQs, but you you might trade 6E or, or 6A contracts. Then that still qualifies for that 60/40 tax treatment. Um, how about how about spot FX? Or how does that qualify? Stock FX or you talk about like spot well, market? Well, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Spot market currencies. Spot market currency. So it's the actual currency itself. Yeah. So you're trading an FX account, uh, meaning you're trading the euro, U.S. pair 
on a spot basis at say FXCM or one of those large um, foreign exchange uh, trading firms. Does it is that treated with the same uh, preferential treatment as futures, or is that taxed like it's a it's a stock? It's taxed as if it was. It's actually not taxed as if it was uh, uh, a stock, but it's taxed as ordinary income, ordinary losses. So currency gotcha. transactions would be ordinary income, ordinary loss. Stocks are going to be capital gains, you know, capital losses. But if it's short term, it's taxed at ordinary tax rates. Okay, I so see. So it's a, it's a little bit different, but. Um, the net effect, I think, of what you're you're saying is true, which it's it's taxed at ordinary income rates, um, but uh, it's not taxed. You know, it doesn't get the preferential treatment that you would for uh, Section 1256 or or uh, futures contracts. Okay. Okay. Is is that all you had for that first question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. The next uh, most common question we have is, uh, should I incorporate my trading business? In other words, should I be set up as an LLC or um, an S-Corp or, or an entity as opposed to trading as an individual? How's that looked at from a tax perspective? Well, you, you know, from, from my perspective, you know, the predominant thing that I, I look at for, you know, helping somebody decide if they should incorporate or, or not incorporate would be, in my opinion, the desire for earned income. Um, you, you know, understand that trading gains is is taxed as uh, uh, unearned income. You know, so it, 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 in order to take advantage of maybe retirement plans or healthcare deductions, you need earned income on a, a tax return. So if if trading is your primary mode of of earning a living, then you might want to incorporate in order to create that earned income so that you can get further deductions with healthcare and retirement plans. Um, otherwise, if you're just starting out and you're, you're kind of just getting going, I actually had a conversation with a trader earlier today who was kind of in that boat. Uh, they work full time and they're kind of trading on the side to, to, to get going. You may just operate as a sole proprietor. It might make the most sense for you because you don't need you know, to generate earned income because you've got a W-2 job uh, that, uh, you know, that you can participate in health care and retirement plans through that. Um, and then if your trading business gets up to a level um, that it may make sense in order to, to uh, incorporate. So um, I think as a guideline, I, that's how I kind of look at it. You know, um, your rough guideline is, is do they need the earned income or not? Um, Tax-wise, the deductions you're going to get outside of, of retirement plans and outside of health care deductions, you're generally a lot of the same deductions you're going to get as a sole proprietor that you would as a uh, LLC, trading through an LLC or, or an S-Corp. So, you know, you, you don't really you know, lose anything from that standpoint. It, it really comes down to, in my opinion, if you need to set up a health care plan or, or set up a retirement plan, uh, is those needs uh, would be met through incorporating. Okay. When you say sole proprietor, are you talking about a sole proprietorship in the form of just an individual using their own um, you know, Social Security number and stuff to set up an account versus uh, an individual becoming an entity and then using that to set up an account. Sole proprietorship is basically just be staying as an individual, right? It, it is, yes. It'd be just staying as an individual. So your trading account would be in your name, um, and, uh, and you know, in, in essence, you're just a uh, uh, sole proprietor means they're going to fill out a Schedule C on their tax form, and that's where, you know, that's where they're going to look at their deductions and things like that. Okay. Um, one thing I'd like to point out, I think I sent you an email on this today, um, the, the CME group, which includes the CBOT, CME, COMEX, NYMEX, um, is looking at, and there's a big debate in the industry that's happening in the background where uh, uh, futures, uh, uh, FCMs and, and IBs are fighting the CME to avoid raising rates on data. Uh, the CME wants to raise data fees uh, come March of 2014 so that you're not able to just view data uh, for free as you do now. They want to charge for it. And the charge is significantly higher if you're uh, an LLC or registered as a corporation because the CME right now as it sits is looking at that as a, a professional trader. The rates for professional traders are much higher than for an individual. Uh, there's There are two arguments going on. One, if the fees should even go up, so everybody's fighting that because 
the futures industry has been going through a sort of an upheaval and uh, and this further <laughs> sets us back um, and then the second issue is that just because you're trading under your landscaping business or you've set up an account under your um, you know law practice or whatever it is that does not make you a professional trader you're a professional in some other um, in some other line of business but not in trading so there are two things so if it if it's if it comes down to it and the CME sticks to its guns and argues that if you're set up as an LLC or an S Corp uh, or any sort of entity a trust or what have you then you're a professional trader then it, again uh, this this goes to Steve's point that you know it doesn't make a difference really for you to trade as an individual versus um, an entity uh, Steve what is the uh, by the way none of this fee stuff is finalized it's still something that's up for debate and discussion but the, this is how the this is where the industry or the CME is moving uh, Steve at what can you give us a rule of thumb um, as to at what point uh, of earnings does it start to make sense to incorporate uh. That's a you know that's a great question. I I would say generally you know maybe in the the fifty thousand range, um, it would definitely make sense because then you're 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 talking about I mean one of my favorite it's not one of the questions that's on here but I mean I can briefly describe it but one of my favorite tools for traders is the um, individual four hundred one k plan or or the solo four hundred one k plans because you can in essence um, you can put a hundred percent of your your earnings into it as as the business owner. Up to you know the limits, and and right now it's at seventeen thousand five hundred, um, um, or if you're over fifty, you can put an additional five thousand in and make it you know twenty two thousand five hundred. So, in essence, you know to, to to keep it as simple as possible, you you can pay yourself seventeen five out of your trading business as a W two and put that whole seventeen five away for um, um, for uh, uh, retirement, if you will, and then you know you you you've cut your your taxable income by that amount, um, yeah. and you know you're saving three, four, five thousand, if not more, in in taxes. You know just by being able to utilize that vehicle. So, um, you know, so I, you I would put that in an IRA or something, right? What What was that? You would put that in an IRA or some other uh, retirement vehicle. It would. It wouldn't be an IRA, but it would be a four hundred one k plan, an individual four hundred one k plan um, set up at uh, one of the other, you know, a brokerage firm or something like that. That, that gotcha. Would, that would be able to, to utilize that. So, I think it's a great tool that you can use. But again, that, that gets down to you know size-wise, where where should you be? And and I, I think to to you know truly take advantage of, of what a, a, a corporate structure could do for you, it probably makes sense in that fifty thousand and above range. Um, there's other instances, you know, it, it should you incorporate or not? I mean, and and I think uh, you know some other reasons that you might find to incorporate would be if you're if you're on the cusp, if you of of really qualifying as a trader in securities, you know that you know if you really were afraid of audit, you you might incorporate because audit rates are lower for corporate uh, returns than they are for individuals. Um, so if you're you know if you're and we'll talk about that I think as as one of the other questions about what it, what you need to do to qualify for trader status. I think that's the last question there. But if you're on the cusp, um, you know, incorporating is is a way that you you know you might be able to shield that and 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 qualify for trader status so there might be some reasons underneath that that uh, that would make sense but I think in generality is to really take advantage of the deductions you could get you're probably in that 50,000 range okay yeah that's exactly uh, that's exactly what I've heard it's uh, the 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 cutoff line is about 50,000 uh, and the uh, probability of being audited is much lower uh, as a corporation than as an individual um, and it's one of the reasons I incorporated immediately when I got into the business. Um, next question: If I file as a trader in securities, will that cause an audit? That, uh, that's a great question. I get that quite a bit. Um, and the the uh, the I think the simple answer is no. Um, and uh, you know, it, it just isn't it automatically going to cause an audit. I think what would cause an audit is if you're questionable. In qualifying for trader status, and and again we'll address you know what what it takes to qualify for trader status I think towards the end. But you know the the, the cases that I've seen that that go to tax court 
and, and the courts rule uh, in favor of the IRS, in other words, they bust trader status and tax that individual as an investor, not a trader, um, it, it has all been cases where you know they really didn't even qualify for trader status in the first place. So I think if you meet the requirements, um, you know, you, you should never fear, and I've never seen it cause an audit just because you've, you've you know, claimed trader status and, and, and taken deductions. Um, there was a recent case that I, I it, it actually made me laugh when I, I read through this case, but it was Sharon Nelson uh, was the tax case that just recently came through where this lady lost uh, trader status. And she didn't even qualify for, you know, to file as a trader, I think, based off of her activity level. But then I think what really caused her audit was what she was trying to deduct on, on her taxes. And, you know, we've got things like advertising. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, traders out there really have much advertising expense, but she was trying to claim that on her taxes. She tried to claim legal and professional fees of $352,000 off of her taxes. Um, how rent, much, how uh, much was she claiming she made? How much was she claiming she made trading? I hope it was more than that. Uh, it was more, well, I'd have to look at the case again, FT. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was more than that. I mean, I think it might have been a couple million bucks. Okay. Um, but generally, traders don't have, you know, professional, you know, legal and professional fees like that. Um, rent, you know, of 59000 supplies of 24000 utilities of 23000 I mean, generally, traders don't have those, those uh, types of expenses. Um, and I think that is really, you know, what in and of itself, you know, triggered her audit more than her just claiming trader, trader status. So, um, so to answer the question, no, I, I, it, it doesn't cause an audit. I've never seen it cause an audit. Um, and, and I think if you're questionable of qualifying for trader status, um, you know, err on the side of, of caution there, maybe don't claim it. But for the most part, if you meet the requirements, you know, it's not going to cause an audit for you to claim it. Okay. Um, question I have just so before we move out of this topic, it says, uh, what, uh, what was he talking about having to pay to be audited? Um, Sid is asking this question. I think that's a confusing question. Um, Steve did not say you have to pay anything, anything to be audited. I, I believe you're referring to the uh, probability that an audit with a, would occur as an individual is higher, the instance of, of an audit taking place is higher than it is when you're incorporated. Uh, but Steve also outlined the conditions under which incorporating um, as a trading business would make sense. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and, and FTF, if, if you look at the audit rates of LLCs, S-Corps, and, and, and you know, partnership type returns, it's under one half of 1% get audited mm -hmm. um, versus the, you know, Schedule C businesses in general of about 8 to 10 percent. Wow. So it's, e even a Schedule C business, I mean, you're talking, you know, 1 out of 10 that might get audited versus, you know, uh, out of 100 returns, you know, you'd have 200 returns and one S-Corp would get audited out of every 200 returns. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, you know, to your point, it is a lot uh, more more likely to get audited as a Schedule C business than you would as an S or an LLC or you know along those lines. What about as an individual? That that would be an individual. Individual. That trader. is a Schedule C. Okay. Yes, that's Schedule C. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's, an, that's an individual trader. Okay. Uh, the next and, question. And by the way, too, most of the tax cases that I've seen where the traders have lost their trader status were all sole proprietors. They they were not incorporated. I see. Okay. That makes sense. Um, let's see. We have some questions here. Can you can you claim? Uh, actually, the question is from Ross. Can you claim home office deduction as a trader? And I think you address that uh, lay, later on here. What you can? Uh, let's see. I think there's a question Second in here. Second to last but, question. Yeah. So we'll hit that then. Um, HC says because of the new CME fees coming in January, can I trade under an LLC but the account not be in an LLC? Uh, probably not. I could tell you uh, I'm a registered broker, but I don't do the brokerage myself. My partner does. But I can tell you that uh, who, if, you're, if your account is set up as an LLC, the money needs to come from that company's uh, account, and the person trading has to be an authorized trader from that LLC, so you can't really 
um, get around it. But I, the, when it comes to the CME fees in January, that's going across the board. They're just raising uh, the rates by a small uh, amount, a few cents or something per side. Um, but there are also, what I was referring to is what, what's uh, being debated for March, which is data fees uh, going up. Um, Paul is asking, I trade from home, can I deduct a backup generator for power to my house at $10,000? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I would say you, you could probably get a percentage of it, I, I think, to be safe, because it's not used just for your uh, you know, for your your trading, it's going to be used for your home in general, and so I would I would calculate it based into the home office expense and take a, a portion of it uh, as as a deduction for your your uh, uh, trader taxes. Okay, and that's you'll talk about that further uh, down the yeah. list of questions here. Uh, the next question: I've been trading for the past few years, but have not filed a tax return as a trader. Can I go back and change that? Uh, yes, you can go back and amend the last two years' worth of tax returns, um, provided that you met the requirements. Um, so, you know, if you've had the same level of activity and 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 whatnot for the last few years, but you just never, maybe you weren't aware of of the the tax status and and uh, and and knew that you could file that way, um, you can go back and amend those. And in essence, what you're going to end up doing is just going back and claiming your expenses. Um, but yes, you could do that. If somebody has not done that or has done that with H and R Block or uh, Jackson Hewitt or one of these, like you know, McDonald's of, of tax accounting <laughs> type of uh, quick fix uh, tax uh, tax services, they can they can come to you for um, for you to check their taxes for the past couple of years and see what else they can uh, you can you can help them take off their tax bill and maybe get another return back. In other words, once you've selected someone, if you're using Quicken online or whatever, or one of these walk-in type of uh, tax accounting firms uh, services, uh, you'll, you'll, you, still, you would still be able to look at their tax return and glean from it what has been missed and what has not. You don't have to stay with, just because you started with H&R Block or somebody, you don't have to stay with them. You can just bring your file to uh, Steve to shrink my taxes, and it, they would, you would still be able to uh, process that return for them if you see that there is, in fact, uh, a, an advantage to going back a few years and checking, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, don't, I don't charge to go back and look at everything, but obviously if there's amended work that needs to be done is where I would charge. But you know, to have a look at it and to sit down with a trader and talk to them about even does it make sense to amend it, you know, maybe dollar-wise it doesn't really make sense. Um, but if it does and, and they want me to proceed, then, yeah, I can get all that work done for them and, uh, and, and get it all taken care of, correct. Okay. And, and I cringe when I hear people talk that they, they've gone to H&R or, or Liberty or, or one of those other places. <laughs> of you, course. If you've got a trading return, I can tell you that they're not, they may not even be aware that uh, futures get preferential tax treatment. <laughs> yeah. Um, Josh was asking, are earnings from options on futures, not just options, uh, are they taxed at the 60/40 rate since they're options? Uh, that's a great. Features? That's a great question. Um, yes, they are. You've got um, you've got uh, underneath those 1256 contracts. After you, you also have broad-based stock index options. So if you trade options on NQ, ES, YM, uh, SPX, NDX, RUT, and TF, those would all qualify for uh, the the Section 1256 uh, tax treatment. Okay, that's great. Um, next question: I lost money trading last year. Can I claim the loss as a mark-to-market loss? Can you can you first this. explain what a mark-to-market loss is before you answer that question? Is that possible? <clears throat> yes, I will. Um, mark-to-market is um, it's an accounting method uh, for your trading, and if you qualify under trader tax status, you can then change your accounting method to the mark-to-mark -mark method. So in essence, what you're doing is you're, you're changing the way that your gains and losses are calculated um, from capital gains and capital losses to ordinary gains and ordinary losses. And, and it's, it's important because of the way that the loss is treated. Um, ordinary losses, if you trade stocks, as an example, uh, if, you, if you have a gain and you trade stocks or you trade regular options, 
Um, it's generally for traders, it's short term in nature, which means it's taxed at your ordinary income rates. Under mark to market, that taxation is the same. It's, it's, it, all the gains are, tr are taxed as ordinary income rates. The losses is where the difference comes into play. Under mark to market, that loss is not treated as a capital loss, but it's treated as an ordinary loss. And why is that important? Well, it's important because under capital loss rules, you're restricted to being able to offset capital gains, and then you can take an additional $3,000 off uh, against other income on your tax return. An ordinary loss, on the other hand, you can take 100% of that loss in the year that the loss is generated as long as you've got other income on your tax return to offset that. And uh, if it exceeds the income, then it's, it's carried forward as a, as a net operating loss. Um, so you know, it, that's the advantage if, if you've, uh, from mark to market is that you don't end up with a ton of these you know, capital loss carryovers. And, and I see it quite a bit where traders come in and, and, uh, and, and they've got significant capital losses and, and you know, they maybe had a W-2 job. If they were under mark to market, they would have been able to realize those losses as opposed to just taking them at $3,000 a year. Yeah, so they have like 300 years worth of 3,000 a year loss, yeah. losses they can take. So just to put that into perspective, uh, let's say I made $100,000 in wages this year as I traded, but then, <clears throat> but then I lost $50,000 uh, trading. On the mark-to-market scenario, I can take the 50000 out of the 100000 in wages that I've earned and then basically be responsible for the tax on the remaining 50. Is that correct? That would be correct. Under capital gains scenario, um, if you took, if you made $100,000 in wages, but you took um, $50,000 in capital loss, uh, essentially all you can write off is three grand? Right, and, and you're taxed on the 97,000 and then 47,000 of that capital loss that was left over gets carried over to the next year. So now you have 47,000, three of which you claim this year. Next year you get to claim three more thousand, so that brings it to 44,000 and so on and so forth for as long as it takes to where to basically uh, take that loss down, and that's where you're capped, right? Right, yep. Okay, so you can see the significant difference between mark to market loss as opposed to a capital loss. It's very important. Uh, to to be with a tax accountant who understands the difference and not all of them do. Um, how does the net investment income tax affect me as a trader? Uh, FD, real quick, getting back to that uh, mark to market loss. I mean, it. it um, let me finish up with a couple things there. It's um, uh, it's important to know that if you're profitable as a futures trader, um, and futures are are you know predominantly what you trade, you you don't want to take that mark to market election because um, you know, you're, you're giving up, you know, you're, everything's going to get taxed at ordinary income rates and you're going to give up that preferential treatment. So, you know, I, you know if you're a futures trader and you're doing well and you're, you're consistently profitable, um, you know, that's something that you, you, you probably don't want to do. But to get the mark to market, you have to make an election on your tax return. So to get back to answering the question, if you lost money in 2013, you can't turn around and then claim mark to market. So you 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 know you're you're kind of stuck already with the decision you made for 2013 as a capital loss, but going forward you you should evaluate does it make sense to maybe go mark the market for 2014 and and further. So okay. That's that that would be what you, you you know and I can sit down and talk to the traders and help them you know make that you know help them see the positives and negatives of of making you know that choice. Okay. A uh, question relating to this uh, to this particular question you just uh, replied to. Can you clarify what it takes to, uh, to to take the mark to market loss in the example? Uh, what 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 does it take uh, in order to participate in that mark to market loss uh, election? You, you know, when you do so, if you haven't done it and you you decide that okay, I do want to go mark the market for my trading um, and and for my cap gains and losses, then in your 2013 tax return that you're filing, you know, here in a few months, you're going to make that election. You're going to let the IRS know that you're a trader in securities and you're electing mark the market for your trading business effective, you know, tax year, you know, January 1st of 2014 and and beyond, in essence. So okay. you know that's the step that needs to happen, and then what's going to happen is your um, trading, you know, gains and losses for 2014 would be under the mark-to-market rules. 
So it's well, just a choice that you make essentially on your tax form. Yes, it's a choice that you're, it's a statement that you're attaching to the tax form. There's no box to check or anything like that, but, but you're, you're making a statement. Okay. Um, and then there's some additional forms that you got to fill out and do, um, you know, it, it, the following year. You're going to have some other forms that are going to need to be processed with your tax return to, um, to, to do it. But so it's a little bit more complicated than that. But in essence, the first step is just to make the election on your, your tax return for 2013. Okay. So you know, so keep in mind any traders out there that are considering that, you know, I'm happy to have a conversation with you, and and you know, we can talk about your particular situation, whether it makes sense or not. Um, but just know that you'll need to make that election and that determination prior to filing that tax return for 2013. So don't file your tax return and then say, yeah, I want to do mark to market because it's going to be too late, and you'll have to put it off until the next year unless you form an entity. But that's another story. But you know, just know that you know you want to make that that determination prior to filing that 2013 tax return. Okay. Um, a question that's being asked here uh, related: a person saying, "I have carry forward capital losses from trading stocks. How are my gains from trading futures treated in terms of offsetting the carry forward capital losses?" Um, that's a that's a great question, and and. Uh, and I'll address that question, but I want, also want to address maybe another question that, that isn't being asked, getting back to mark to market. But in, and to answer that person's question, the capital losses from your stocks will offset the, the gains on your futures. So if you, if you traded um, you know, and, and you've got $100,000 of losses going forward and you made $50,000 trading futures this year, you're not going to owe any taxes because that $100,000 loss is going to, in essence, wipe out that $50,000 gain from your futures, and you'll still have $50,000 of losses carried into the following year. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, now, getting back to to market market, what you know, what may not be a question that's being asked, but I don't know if it's on anybody's mind. That same situation, and let's say that trader is trying to determine if he if he wants to go to mark the market or not, and he's got $100,000 of capital losses. Understand that once you make the election to mark the market, you're transforming the uh, category of your gains to ordinary gains, meaning that the capital losses will not offset those ordinary gains. So if I've got a $100,000 capital loss carried over from, from uh, 2013 going into 2014, and then next year I went mark to market and I made $50,000, I'll be able to offset it by 3000 from the capital losses, but I won't be able to offset that entire 50000 um, because I've changed the category or the bucket, if you will, of, of where that in income is classified as. So keep that in mind, and that's one of the things that I talk to a trader about, you know, and, and find out more about is if, if they are carrying some significant capital losses, you know, care, uh, moving over to mark to market may not be the best course for them because of, of that situation. Yeah, it's a very, very big uh, point you're making. Uh, because you can't you can't change the mark to market and then say oh by the way I had losses so now I want to claim those now they're kind of set in stone once that year is done with right okay um, let's see if anything is related if one's trading business is a qualified uh, is a qualified husband and wife joint venture does the trading account need to be open as a partnership even though this type of venture can elect to file as a sole proprietorship. What's the drawback in terms of audit if you elect to file as a sole proprietor? This goes back up to the second question. Okay, so you've got a, 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 a husband-wife joint partnership, and and you know the, it's true that they can elect to to file as a sole proprietor, but it's two sole proprietors. So it's a husband sole proprietor and a wife sole proprietorship. Um, where I think you would run into problems in that situation is, is if, let's say, you know, and, and no offense to anybody, just try, trying to keep it simple, but let's say the husband is doing the trading, and it's a husband-wife partnership, and he's got the account in his name, but but they're going to file two separate sole proprietorships. I mean, you know, you could lose part of the deductions for some of the expenses off of the wife's um, sole proprietorship, Schedule C, if you will, because she's not trading. Um, so... You know, in my instance, in something like that, I would say you just make it a joint account. It doesn't have to be in the name of an XYZ partnership, but just make it a joint account if it's a husband-wife partnership. Um, you know, put the money into a joint account and trade it that way, and, and you know, you won't have to worry about filing two separate, you know, Schedule Cs. This is exactly the kind of uh, the. This is exactly the reason why I felt that doing this topic was very important because. 
what you're doing with your trading business now can has a can have a, a pretty strong effect on the outcome come tax season and the the net profits you have for the next year if you made money or the net tax liability so to me the the cost of speaking to someone who is a, a tax expert uh, is is so minuscule um, you know when it when you off when you look at uh, the kind of money we deal with as traders the kinds of losses and gains that we can participate in uh, it just makes sense and this this sort of thing where you have a partnership uh, and one partner uh, trades and the other does not and the losses uh, and gains and how they're taxed is just tremendous uh, it's just very very important to have someone that you can call uh, to find out what the right structure is do you want to move on to the next question yeah, the uh, net investment income tax. Yes. The, uh, so again, the question is, how does the net investment income tax affect my, me as a trader? Can you start by explaining what the net investment income tax is? Yes. It's a. Um, this was all done, I believe, back in 2010 with the Affordable Care Act, and um, and it's a 3.8 percent tax or additional tax, if you will, on a certain net investment income. And, and I'll, I'll give you a definition of what they qualify as net investment income here in a second. But in essence, where it's calculated is 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 there's threshold. So if you're single, if you're a single tax filer, your threshold is two hundred thousand. Meaning that if you don't make over two hundred thousand, you're not going to be subject to this three point eight percent. If you make over that, then that's where you know you should start to be concerned about about the uh, three point eight percent tax. And I'll, I'll give you some examples here in a second. If you're married filing jointly, it's uh, 250,000 is the threshold. Um, so what's included in net investment income? Um, interest, dividends, capital gains, rental and royalty income. So even rental properties. You know, if you've got rental properties, um, that's that's going to be subject to this 3.8 percent. Non-qualified annuities. If you're not familiar with that, a, a non-qualified annuity is one that isn't a um, inside of an IRA. Um, so it's, it's it's an annuity you might own outside of an IRA. Okay. Um, income so, from business, and, and and this is kind of a quote. So I think they were actually going after. I think one of the reasons they did this was really going after the hedge fund businesses <laughs> that you know make a billion dollars and claim it the dividend. But this is a quote from the IRS: Income from businesses involved in trading of financial instruments or commodities. So obviously that that is is what we do here. So even if you incorporate your your business, your your you know, you're trading financial instruments, so you're going to be subject to this 3.8 percent. And the threshold is 200,000 for an individual and 250,000 for a couple. Is that correct? It is. Okay. So, so essentially, so how do, mm -hmm, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So essentially, it's a, sort of an additional tax on higher a higher uh, income individuals is what it is. Yes. Yes. And so, just because you have earn, uh, net investment income, your interest, dividends, capital gains doesn't mean you're going to owe the tax unless you're over those thresholds. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples, and maybe this will make it a little bit clearer uh, as to who you know you may or may not be affected by this. But let's just look at a single filer, and let's uh, let's say that um, you had wages of 100000 You know, you had a job, and you got a W-2 wage of 100000 and you made $90,000 trading. Um, you're, you're at 190000 You're under the $200,000 threshold, so that means you do not owe any tax because you're under the threshold. Any additional you, tax? Any additional tax, yes. Sorry about that. Any 3.8%. Any you're not, you're not you're subject to the uh, net investment income tax. Okay. Um, if, you, if you made $150,000 um, as a W-2 job and maybe $100,000 trading, now you're at $250,000, so you're over the threshold by $50,000, so that the tax is... is, um, is is assessed on the lower of the amount you're over the threshold or your net investment income. Now, in this case, the net investment income was a hundred thousand. They were over the threshold by fifty thousand, so fifty thousand is the lower number. That's what's used to calculate the tax at three point eight percent, and they would owe an additional nineteen hundred dollars in taxes gotcha. on their tax return. Yeah, so it's just the, the the delta between what you earn to the hundred thousand. That's what gets charged at three point eight percent. It's it's the um, it's the amount over the threshold, um, or your net investment income, whichever's lower, is what's going to get charged at three point eight percent. Gotcha. 
Okay. Okay. So, so you know, so in 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 essence, let's say a, a guy maybe to clear one more point, but let's say an individual uh, single filer made two hundred fifty thousand and had ten thousand dollars of uh, net investment income, they would get charged three point eight percent on the ten thousand because that would be the amount, the lower amount between the two. Okay. Okay. So so it, it may or may not affect traders. It just depends on if they're over the thresholds or not. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the next question, if I file as a trader in securities, will that mean I owe self-employment taxes on my trading gains? Uh, n no. Um, you won't. Uh, trading, whether you file as a trader or, or you know, even if you've incorporated your trading business, it doesn't transform your trading gains into um, uh, self-employment income. You know, that's... It's just the nature of the beast. I mean, they, they, the IRS views um, capital gains, capital losses, and ordinary you know, gains, ordinary losses as unearned income if you're trading. So regardless of whether you're an S-Corp, LLC, or as a whole proprietorship, um, you're not, you're not, you don't owe self-employment taxes on those dollars. Okay. Let's see now. Okay, uh, next thing. Um, what am I allowed to deduct as a trader? And I want to start off by answering, having you answer the two questions that were already asked. Can you claim your home office deduction as a trader? Do you want to just list to us examples of what a trader is allowed to deduct? Which one do you want to do? Um, yes, I can. I can. I can run down. You know, run down a quick list um, and give some examples. So. In essence, qualifying as a trader in securities, that gives you deductions um, above and beyond what an investor can take. So an investor, you know, if your tax is an investor, you can't take deductions like home office and, and, and other things that you can as if you're a trader. So, you know, just some of the things that, that you're allowed to deduct is like chat room subscriptions, uh, your data fees. I know we, we talked about that earlier, uh, but that's deductible as a trader. Uh, software, you know, trading software, newsletters, newspapers, trading books, cell phones, um, wireless internet cards, uh, internet service, any trading seminars, travel and entertainment and meals to and from, you know, educational events you can deduct. Um, wages paid to family members, you know, if you have a kid who's really good with computers and they help you set things up, I mean, it's a great way to reduce your tax, reduce your taxes is to pay family members, but that's possible as a trader, not as an investor. Um, home office, uh, which was what the question was asked, but yeah, that's that's deductible as a trader. That absolutely isn't as an investor. Um, you deducting computers and and laptops and things like that that you use for your trading business, monitors, things like that. Office supplies. Um, another big one is margin interest. You know, margin interest is 100% deductible on Schedule C as per trader, but it's restricted for investors. You're able to uh, to deduct it as an investor, but it's really restricted with what you're able to deduct. Tax preparation fees, um, you know, you, you're 100% you're deductible on your Schedule C for traders and corporation fees are deductible. Um, so things like that that you're able to deduct as a trader. But, I mean, you're potentially talking, this depends on the setup and the amount of money that you've spent, but, I mean, you're, 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 you're potentially talking, you know, thousands of dollars that you're able to deduct as a trader versus an investor. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the uh, home office deduction, uh, you obviously cannot just write off your mortgage or your entire rent. How do you determine what portion of your home office you can deduct? That's a that's a great question, FT. And and um, there's there's actually two methods. And 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 again, getting back to your point of trying to work with a, an accountant who you know who kind of goes the extra mile, if you will. But the the simple thing of most people, if you go to the you know the the box. You know, accountants there, the the H and R's or anything like that. They give you a home office deduction. They're going to take the square footage of your office and divide it by the square footage of your home and call it a day. And and that's one method. But the IRS actually gives you three methods uh, that you can use to calculate um, your home office deduction. The second method is the one that I like to use because more often than not, it it results in a larger percent uh, for your home office deductions. And that's the rooms method. And, and in essence, you're going to look at the rooms in your house. Um, and divide it by the rooms that you know the the rooms that you're using for your office, which generally is going to be one, and divide that by the number of rooms in the house, and that typically will give a trader a, a, a greater percent that they're able to deduct for their their home office. So I usually calculate both ways, 
and obviously we're going to go with the way that gives the, the uh, um, you know my clients the, the bigger deduction. So, and then does that apply to also your uh, internet uh, ISP services, uh, some power, a um, little bit of uh, electricity, and things like that? That, that those are also a, a part of that calculation, right? Yeah, so what what you've got is your operating expenses. So I think that somebody asked earlier about the the, um, the generator. You know, all that stuff gets calculated within that home office. So you're looking at um, you're looking at a, a percentage of things like your um, your interest expense, your mortgage interest, your real estate taxes, your um, uh, your homeowners insurance, your homeowners fees, uh, and then getting into operational expenses like utilities. Uh, you know, such as electricity, you know, wa water, um, sewer pickup, you know, gas, things like that that you're able to deduct a, a percentage of. And that gets into things like your, your Internet that is a shared for the home, um, you know, telephone, you know, things like that that might be also shared with the home that you're going to be able to deduct a percentage of for your, your home office. You can and also – um, I'm ahead. sorry? Go ahead. I was going to say, then you get into things like uh, home improvements too. So um, if you've got anything that is um, – uh, a direct expense to your home office, for instance, if you put in new flooring in your home office, that's that's a direct expense at 100% versus putting flooring in the rest of the house, which would be the percentages. You're able to take a percent of the flooring or, or repair maintenance for the house, things like that. Does your trading office have to be an isolated office with its own entrance and all that good stuff, or can it be just a den you know, next to your living room? Um, generally, it doesn't have to have its own entrance, but generally you, you want a, a room that's going to be dedicated to the trading. So um, you, you know, a den might not make sense unless it's kind of, you know, it, it's something that you've set up exclusively for your trading. But if you go through and there's a, there's a couch in there with a television and, and a gaming system and stuff like that, um, if the IRS audited that, they may bust that home office because they don't really consider that, you know, a, an office used exclusively for business. So, you know, you're going to want a room, you know, maybe a spare bedroom or a spare room or something like that that you're going to set up and, and dedicate towards your uh, trading. Okay. Um, Amy's asking, is that, does the computation for the number of rooms apply to bedrooms or is it the total number of rooms in the house? Um, it's, uh, that's a good question. So the, the way that, the, that I do it um, and the way that you would look at it is to don't, you know, exclude like bathrooms, but look at your main rooms like bedrooms, but you're also going to look at your kitchen, your family room, your dens, etc. So, you know, you might have three bedrooms, a kitchen, you might have a, a den and a formal, you know, living room type area and, a, um, you know, a, a formal dining room. So you may have seven rooms total, so you'd use one out of seven would be the uh, calculation in that example. So you gotcha. don't count bathrooms, but you count your main rooms. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, how uh, is the, has the IRS provided a flat deduction amount now that bypasses all these calculations? Uh, Paul's asking. Uh, they have, and uh, it and um, it's uh, the flat deduction is is I believe off the top of my head I believe it's up to fifteen hundred dollars. It's more of a simple calculation, mm -hmm. so you don't need to keep tabs and all that other stuff. But generally, for you know, for most traders, if you've got um, uh, you know, you've got a mortgage and other things on the house, you're going to be greater than that by by calculating it out. Okay. Um. The next question, if we trade in an IRA, are all the trading expense deductions disallowed, or can you, can you still take those deductions? That's a, that's a great question. Um, in cases like that, if you trade inside of an IRA, it, 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 you, you are generally not going to qualify for trader tax status. So, um, and I've had that question come up before. So you know, you, you'd, you'd want to trade a taxable account in order to, to get the benefits of trader tax status. Okay. Uh, another question, what are the requirements to qualify for the deduction? I've set up an account, but no live trades this year as of yet. Um, that's, a, that's another really good question. So I, to answer that, I would say what, what are the intentions going forward? So, you, you know, you might not be able to deduct anything for 2014 or, I'm sorry, 2013 taxes, but 
um, next year you'd be able to kind of roll over some of the expenses as long as they were within a reasonable time frame of when you started trading. So let's say here in December you, you did an educational, you know, web or an educational trading course and you spent a couple grand on it and you didn't really start live trading until maybe February or so of 2014. Well, then you'd roll those expenses into uh, uh, 2014 as, as startup expenses for your trading business. So I generally use about a six-month window uh, is where I would, I would say. Um, but, but, um, but generally, you want to start trading within about six months of when you start to incur your expenses. Okay. So that answers the question that Steve asked, which is uh, once you form or fund your LLC, how far back can you go uh, can you go for expenses such as training and equipment? And you're saying in general, rule of thumb, six months. Yes. Okay. Uh, a uh, So I don't see any other uh, deduction-based questions, but uh, one more from Andy. Just to be absolutely clear, deductions as a trader, quote, rather than an investor, are you only are, are only available to traders who qualify for trader tax status? Is that correct? Uh, to do tax work? To take the deductions as a trader, you know, for your home office, margin yes. interest. You have to qualify uh, for trader tax status first. Yes. Yeah. In, in other words, your trading has to rise to a, the, the level that you are a a, a trader in securities or a business trader, if you will, in order to take those deductions. If you if it doesn't, and that's you know where these court cases kind of come into play, where these people have claimed that they're traders and they they um, uh, the court rules it against them, then they're busted down to being taxed as an investor and they lose all these deductions. Then they owe penalties, interest. The you know they 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 really get taken to the cleaners because of that. Um, so yeah, you, you want to make sure that you qualify for trader status, and then if you qualify, then you're able to take those deductions. Okay, that leads us into the next question. I started living in Oct uh, started live trading in October 2013. Can I qualify for trader tax status? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. So, it, 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 you know, how I, I look at that question is, look, if, if I if I was to start any business, um, and and I started a business, you know, a, a lawn care business in October of this this past year, I'm still a business. It, it, I can't maybe take deductions on other things that I did earlier in the year, but yeah, from that point forward and within that six month window that I talked about, we can take deductions for that business. But yeah, okay. I mean, if you just started live trading. And as long as you're trading and meet the requirements from that point forward and to qualify under under the uh, tax rules as a trader, then absolutely, yeah, you can you can claim trader status and, and, and take deductions. Okay. So let's address this last question as we're running out of time. Uh, we've taken most, almost all the questions that are out there. How do I qualify for trader tax status? Um, that's... Uh, you know that's that's kind of the uh, uh, the big question, I guess. So if you look at at um, you know what the IRS says, I mean it's under tax tax topic 429, trader and securities. I mean the problem is is that the IRS doesn't give you a set rule. I mean they don't say you do this 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 and this and and you're a trader. Um, you know most of what we know about you know qualifying for trader status comes from the court cases, and we kind of look for what what the, the the tax courts are looking for and try to determine okay here's Here's a trader, and here's somebody that would be an investor. But um, you know, according to the IRS, you know, under Tax Topic 429, they the three things that they they say in order to qualify for trader securities is that you must seek the profit from daily market movements and the prices of securities, and not from dividends, interest, or capital appreciation. Your activity must be substantial, and and that's the key word, meaning you got to meet all three of these. You must carry on the activity with continuity and regularity. So that's the extent of what the IRS says for to qualify for a trader. So you can see where the confusion comes because you don't know what is substantial. You don't know what they consider continuity and regularity. Um, so what do they look for? Um, they're looking at the holding periods of securities bought and sold. Most traders don't really have to worry about this because you, you typically are trading on a daily basis. Um, and maybe do weekly and, and things like that. But for the most part, your trading is short term. Um, you're not going to have anything to worry about. Where we've seen uh, this be an issue in trader cases is where majority of their turnover for the year is long-term capital gains, and they're trying to say that they're a trader, which we know is just not the case. So short-term holding periods, 
the frequency and dollar amount of your trades during the year. Um, the, the frequency is, is the big key here. You want to make sure that you have frequent trades. Um, and the extent to which you pursue the activity to produce income for a livelihood doesn't mean you have to make money, but it means that you, you've got the intent to make money with this and the amount of time you devote to the activity. Those are some of the things that, that the IRS looks for. So if you miss those, if you miss one of those, I'm going to give you some guidelines here in a, in a, in a second, so don't, don't panic. I'll try to clarify it a little bit. But just know that if you miss one of those things that the IRS looks at, you're going to get busted and, and taxed as an investor, and that means you lose home office deductions and, and investment seminar deductions and some of the other things that we, we talked about. It also means you'll, if, you'll lose mark-to-market if, if, uh, if you've tried to elect that. Hmm. So here's some general guidelines. Um, you you want to make sure that, that you've got a substantial portion of your liquid net worth you know, trading in the markets. You want to make sure that you've got at least weekly buys and sells, um, and you should be okay. Daily, obviously, is even better. You want to make sure that you have a substantial number of buys and sells spread throughout the year. Where I've seen that frequency and continuity come an issue in trading cases is where you have a situation where a trader maybe trades for three months takes you know four months off and and reboots their trading account and then you know trades for another few months you know that that's an issue that's not you know that's not there's no continuity in that so they want to see consistent trading throughout the year is what the uh, IRS is looking for yeah in other so, words you can't treat it as a hobby where you just show up do it and leave and then come back again and do it for a little bit and then leave it needs right. to be like a source of it needs to be a job in other words you got it yeah I mean you got to treat it as a business and um, um, so, so the number of buys and sells, they don't really give you anything there, and you know, generally north of 500, you're going to be safe. So if you're trading every day, um, you, you know, and, and you've got you know, one trade a day even, I mean, you're, you're, you're generally going to be close to 500 with your counting buys and sells, round trips. You're going to be close. So um, you know, generally north of 500 trades for the year, you're going to be in that safe status. If you're in that one to 200 range, it's going to be real hard to defend. It doesn't mean you, you can't uh, claim trader status, but if you get audited, that's going to be a hard, um, hard, uh, hard one to defend if you've only got about 100 or 200 trades for the year. Um, your holding periods, I mentioned, should be short-term. Um, you, know, you shouldn't be turning over a lot of say, your portfolio for long-term capital gains because that's, that, that's not consistent with being a trading business. Um, you, you should spend a, you know time watching the markets. Um, I, I always encourage you know guys that maybe just start out to take a, a time log. You know maybe to keep an Excel sheet or something and detailing the times that you're spending trading, um, so that if you do get audited, you've got some some data that you can provide saying that you know I, maybe I, I traded only once this day, but I was you know doing some studying or doing some other research and things like that. So, and I think FT you said you got to treat it like a, a you know a business, and you do. You need to maintain a business like operation, which means keeping good books and records and and you know I think you've recommended before too trading journals you know keep trading journals I mean these are all stuff that's good for you as a trader but come you know come audit if you happen to get audit it's it's going to help you know make your case that you're you know you're treating this as a business and and uh, and qualify as a as a business trader absolutely document it and make sure you have books otherwise it's not really a business um I need to cut it off right here <clears throat> looks like we've answered pretty much everybody's questions there's a, several more technical questions being asked, um, like Mike's. Mike, uh, I would invite you to get a hold of Steve uh, directly. I want to um, direct your attention to this web page here. It's about to pop on your screen. This is the Shrink My Taxes website. Uh, I, I strongly invite you uh, to go to shrinkmytaxes.com forward slash stage five offer dot php you'll find that link on the webinar invitation on my website um, but this is a special deal that uh, Steve has uh, has offered to um, uh, my followers and uh, stage fives traders if you do not have a tax accountant if you rely on a piece of software or uh, on one of those walk-in services that you see <clears throat> in a bit on a business street it really isn't that much more to uh, as far as cost to hire someone who can look at your case uh, much more closely and and keep and it's like it's like uh, having a tax accountant is like having a dentist it's great that you can jump from one dentist to the next every year because they have sales 
but the true advantage is keeping one person who keeps track of your health all along. Um, using the example of a dentist, you know, uh, as an analogy, what the tax what the tax accountant is the same. I've used the same tax accountant for for 13 years now. He knows exactly uh, when uh, an addition happens. This is a person I call before I buy anything, car, invest in anything, uh, and generally they don't charge for that service. I don't know if Steve is, is, if Steve is different, but I really, really strongly suggest you look at this. The cost of my accountant is a whole heck of a lot more than what Steve is charging, but uh, it, it, the savings are tremendous. Just a quick... Uh, a quick check on my taxes uh, can can save me uh, 10 or 20 times the fee being charged for that check. So it's just a very sound investment as traders. We look at risk reward. The reward for hiring uh, somebody who is an expert in the field is well worth the cost. So I strongly invite you to visit uh, shrinkmytaxes.com forward slash stage five, the number five offer dot php. Or uh, go to go to shrinkmytaxes.com. Click on the contact button and leave a message for Steve. Let him know that you're an FT71 follower or Stage Five client, and he'll know what to do. I want to thank uh, Steve for taking an hour out of his day to help us out. Sorry about the technical difficulties at the beginning, uh, and I appreciate you all coming and uh, being a part of this. A recording of this <clears throat> will be posted on futurestrader71.com and it'll be sent out in the newsletter to stage five clients. Of course, Steve, I'm going to give you a, a copy of it for your uh, distribution as well. Thanks so much for being here, Steve. Thanks, FD. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Take care.